Hello, and welcome to our third Critical Thinking and Psychology of Problem Solving lecture. As mentioned last week, the solution to just about any problem we encounter begins with a question. How do I move that large heavy box without assistance from anyone else? What size screws do I need to safely finish my construction project? At what temperature should I cook this casserole? With almost any formal approach to problem solving, we have to use our questions to come up with a problem definition. This definition is the first step to bringing order out of chaos. Two necessary components of, pro of a problem definition are the scope and the goals, and both must be clearly articulated. The scope of the problem simply means one has to understand its magnitude. This understanding helps us to determine the human and material resources necessary to solve the problem, as well as the time constraints, financial constraints, and other factors that have to be dealt with. The goal in problem solving is simply a desired end state. Figuring out how to move that large heavy box unassisted into the back of a truck and accomplishing it is an example. So is determining the correct size of screws needed to successfully screw uh, finish a, a woodworking pro project, or figuring out the correct temperature to make the perfect casserole or examples of desired end states or goals. The scope of the problem has a direct bearing on how one determines the problem solving goal. For example, one might begin with the goal of raising profits in their small business by 10% over the next 24 months. However, after taking stock of his or her other resources, the business owner may have to revise the goal of 10% to a lesser amount, or conversely, keep the 10% goal but increase the time frame to achieve the goal. Once we have the definition of our problem, we then move to problem representation. In a sense, problem representation is like taking an inventory of all the pieces of knowledge or chunks we already have access to in our memory. These mental representations are made up of four parts. The first two, a description of the initial state of the problem and the description of the goal state have pretty much been described on the last slide. That questioning that I said pretty much is the beginning point of any problem solving activity is most helpful in describing the problem's initial state. What is it that you want to accomplish the goal? In one of our examples on the last slide, I mentioned questioning how to lift a large heavy box without assistance. Our goal then is to lift the box. The question the understanding of the goal leads to jump starts our, your understanding of the initial state of the problem. You are, not, you are alone. The box you want to move is both large and heavy. That initial question leads to others that help inform not only the understanding of the initial state, but helps us to discover the allowable operators and set of constraints. What equipment might I have that is both safe and effective in achieving my goal? Do I need any personal protective equipment to achieve my goal, such as wearing a back brace or work gloves? Will my sh sore shoulder allow me to do this? You might think of operators as the resources that, that help in a problem solving situation and constraints as phenomenon that have to be overcome in order to solve your problem. Here are some definitions related to the cognitive processes that come into play in problem solving. The first is convergent thinking. This is a process in which one or more problem solvers starts with quite a few ideas, then whittle them down by eliminating problems that are least viable, hopefully narrowing down to the best workable solution. If you have ever taken part in a brainstorming activity, that second part is a good example of employing convergent thinking. In formal brainstorming, participants are encouraged to call out various ideas that are listed on a flip chart or whiteboard. Participants are instructed not to critique the ideas as they're called out, but to do so after all ideas are listed and exhausted. The stage in which the ideas are critiqued is where the narrowing down takes place. Conversely, diverging thinking takes place when the generation of multiple ideas is desired. The first step in the brainstorming activity is an example of generating divergent ideas. Another cognitive process that comes into play in problem solving is incubation. You've probably had that situation where you beat your brains out trying to solve a problem or even just to remember someone's name only to be frustrated. Then later, when you least expect it uh, and aren't really even thinking, uh, consciously thinking about it, the solution to your problem or the forgotten name comes to you seemingly out of no, nowhere. This is incubation. 
It really isn't magic. Although you were con weren't consciously thinking of your issue, it has been percolating subconsciously until you finally had that aha experience. These are a few of our cognitive problem solving tools, but there are also some ob obstacles to problem solving that we must be aware of. The first obstacle to solving problems we'll discuss is functional fixedness. This occurs when we depend on seeing a problem in its customary fashion. For instance, you see a loose screw, but don't have a screwdriver to tighten it. You might reach in your pocket and find a coin that can be used to tighten the screw. If you were to only think a screwdriver would work, you wouldn't have been innovative enough to realize a coin would do the trick, and you would have been a victim of functional fixedness. As you can see, functional fixedness limits thinking of various ways to solve a problem. Irrelevant or misleading information are two related obstructions to be aware of. Irrelevant information is information that has nothing to do with the problem at hand. And misleading information is riddled with inaccuracy. Either of these issues can lead to spinning our, our wheels, a massive waste of time and energy. We have to be especially vigilant against these two issues when dealing with complex problems. The more legitimate moving parts there are to a problem, the more likely we are to follow irrelevant or misleading information down a rabbit hole. If a problem is relatively simple, however, we can more easily see when information is not germane to the issue at hand, and we can more easily detect misleading information. Assumptions about constraints and obstacles can also be deterrents to problem solving. For example, in our earlier example of the problem of lifting a large heavy box unassisted, you may recall other boxes of similar size that we couldn't lift because they were much too heavy. If we were to assume uh, we couldn't lift a large box without first trying to do so, we may give up without trying simply because of the assumptions we made based on other large boxes that were too heavy to lift. The last obstacle to problem solving we want to discuss is the impediment created by mental sets. This obstacle occurs we were, when we are habitual about applying the same solution to problems that are similar to those solved in the past. While two problems may seem similar at first glance, it's important to determine if those similarities lend themselves to, this, to the, the same solutions. Sometimes this is not the case. An example from my own life involves fixing an overheated radiator in a truck I once owned. Once, I, uh, once my truck overheated and a knowledgeable fr uh, friend suggested I remove the thermostat housing and replace it with a new thermostat. The procedure was relatively easy and it worked. Several years later, I had another vehicle that overheated. I immediately assumed that because the symptoms were similar, I must be dealing with a worn out thermostat again. However, once I did the repair, the problem persisted and, almost, and I ultimately had to have a mechanic fix the issue. Finally, let's talk about specific types of obstacles called impediments to problem solving. The first is groupthink. Groupthink occurs when a group of individuals agree to a conclusion without critically thinking through all of the potential consequences of their decisions. The first video linked on this slide discusses how groupthink was responsible for what is known as the Bay of Pigs fiasco that occurred during John F. Kennedy's presidency. The second video talks about a famous experiment conducted by the researcher Stanley Milgram. Milgram wanted to know how situations like the overtaking of Germany by the Nazi party could take place. His study intended to investigate the phenomenon of obedience to authority. Interestingly, as you'll see in the video, his study resulted in new rules for how studies with human subjects are conducted because the subjects in his study were not fully informed of potential hazards the study might create. But, uh, the, but at any rate, uh, please pay attention to the, 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 the interesting findings of Milgram's study. It, it shows that uh, people tend to blindly follow authority even when what the authority is asking them to do goes against their typical moral or, or ethical judgment. The next slide in this presentation introduces an activity to help you understand one last possible impediment to problem solving that has to do with significant events in your life and how they might influence your approach to problem solving.
Again, why are humans susceptible to such obstacles as problem solving? There may be some clues in our personal histories. Some of us are quite capable of solving problems in one area, but fail miserably in others. For example, I'm quite comfortable working with the Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Word, and Adobe PageMaker software programs, but not other programs such as QuickBooks. Even when I began to learn how to use PageMaker, I had to overcome some of the types of obstacles we've been discussing in this session. For instance, a big problem I had was learning how to use text in PageMaker. I tended to try to use some of the same keys to do some functions as PageMaker that I use in Microsoft Word, but the two programs treat text very differently. So I had to overcome my own mental set of using the Word functions that weren't working in PageMaker. Before we continue with tonight's lecture, I'd like you to take about 20 to 30 minutes to create your own biograph. A biograph is simply a chart or a histogram that shows high and low points throughout your life. The, the chart in this slide, on this slide is an abbreviated biograph of my life. Along the ve left vertical axis of the chart, you'll see the numbers zero through 10. Along the horizontal axis, along the bottom of the chart, you'll see the numbers that relate to the years 1950 through 2020. This biograph shows that I was born in 1952, and I gave that a score of five on a scale of zero to 10, meaning I feel neutral about that event in my life. If you run your figure, uh, finger up from the horizontal line where 1952 would appear and up to the line parallel with five on the vertical scale, you'll find a dot that marks the event of my birth. You can also see that I gave the event of my marriage a high score of eight, finding uh, of eight, where the 1978 and eight intersect on the graph. Now it's your turn. I want you to create a biograph for your life. The purpose is to give you some insight about how events in your life might influence how you deal with certain problems. For instance, my wife passed away in 2006. And as you might imagine, that event got the lowest score on my graph. However, I learned from that event and deal with my own health issues differently than I might if I hadn't had that event occur. Significant events can cause profound changes in our lives. You'll learn more about this after you complete your biograph. You will not turn your biograph into me, so you can put uh, any personal information you want on the biograph without risking uh, other people seeing it. This is only for your, uh, for your learning. Speaking of our life histories, uh, Jack Mesero was an adult education professor at Columbia University who worked with a number of women who were transitioning from abusive marriages into an unknown future for themselves, and in some cases, their children. Not surprisingly, not surprisingly while staying in their abusive relationships was untenable for the women Dr. Mesero worked with, Leaving their husbands was nonetheless a very traumatic and unsettling event in their lives. However, Mesereau discovered that these women underwent what he came to call a perspective transformation. While facing unknown futures and experiencing extreme stress, these women were ultimately able to process the unsettling feelings into a new way of thinking, a perspective transformation that enabled them to cope with all the turmoil in their lives. They realized that they could not only survive, but had the wherewithal to th thrive and find new meanings in their lives that were enabling for them. The positive changes as a result of the women's significant emotional experiences and how they processed them that Mesero observed led, to, led him to understand that we sometimes have to go through earth-shaking events in our lives, like my wife's death in my case, to make significant strides in our personal growth. Have you experienced the per perspective transformation? Has that changed how you might go about solving problems or at least how you might solve a specific type of problem? Now for another chance for you to exercise your problem solving muscles using brain teasers. For each of these, please spend up to 15 minutes trying to solve the problems introduced. After you've either solved the problem or run out of time, you'll be able to see the solution on the pages following, or on the pages after the uh, brain teasers are introduced. 
For each brain teaser, keep notes about how you proceeded through your problem solving exercises. If you recognize any of the obstacles we've discussed in this lecture, identify them and put them in your notes as well. Okay, were you able to solve each of the problems in the time allotted? If not, don't worry. The point of these brain teasers was not for you to get the correct answers, but to recognize how you got from point A to point B, to detect any obstacles that you had to resolve, and to see how events in your life might influence your approach to problem solving. So now let's move on to a discussion of how uh, our uh, different schools of thought might approach problem solving. First up are the behaviorists. As you'll recall, behaviorist, behaviorism got its start with the discoveries Ivan Pavlov made with his dogs and evolved with the work of J.B. Watson and later the work of individuals like B.F. Skinner. In our earlier lectures, we learned that behaviorists believe we learn through our interactions with our environment. Interacting with our environment allows us to learn through a series of trial and errors. For example, when a child touches a hot burner on a stove and feels the pain of a burn, he or she has learned through trial and error not to touch a hot burner. The behaviorists also contend that once we learn a solution to a problem, we tend to habitually reproduce that same solution when faced with similar problems in the future. Recall, however, that the social learning theorists advanced the idea that we learn by observing role models and by modeling their behavior. However, the social psychologists say that we don't just mimic others in a monkey see, monkey do kind of way. Like the Gestaltists, social learning theorists say we don't just respond to stimuli like Pavlov's dogs, but we have the ability to interpret the stimuli and make decisions based on those higher order cognitive abilities. Also, unlike the behaviorists who believe that we solve problems using an habitual reproductive process, the Gestaltists advance the idea that we use productive problem-solving processes. This is consistent with the Gestaltist view that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So, for example, you might work hard trying to uh, trying various solutions to a problem only to continually be frustrated. You decide to put the problem aside and work on something else. Surprisingly, though, when you return to your original problem, you immediately find the solution. This, according to the Gestaltists, is because upon your return to the original problem, you viewed it differently. This is a productive process, or I'm sorry, thus a productive process is claimed to be more efficient because it often produces sudden insights, unlike the reproductive behaviorist approach, in which one has to try multiple solutions he or she has learned in the past until leading to the correct solution. So for the Gestaltists, you may remember that I talked about uh, incubation, and incubation occurs subconsciously when we set a problem aside and our brain is subconsciously working on that problem. And that's what the Gestaltists are talking about here. We, we, we have a, a process that goes on our brain where we combine symbols and, and make new symbols and represent problems in, in unique ways and enable us to come up with this productive process, this unique creative process for solving a problem. It may count or deter, be, depend on some problems we solved in the past, but we have the cognitive ability to pick and choose which parts apply to this new problem. Unlike the behaviorists who believe that we have to use a trial and error uh, approach and, uh, and uh, take a lot of time and try different uh, ideas out before we can solve a problem. The humanistic psychology literature is a little short on how humanists might solve uh, a problem. However, humanists take a holistic view of human psychology that is integrative. In other words, 
to understand what it means to be human, we have to look at not only the human psychological makeup, but also the spiritual, physical, and, and other components of their being. It's safe to say then that the humanists would more readily agree with the views of social learning theorists and gestaltists when it comes to problem solving. Now we'll start to move into the critical, portion, uh, critical thinking portion of the course. We'll wrap up this lecture with, this, with a discussion of some critical thinking basics. Uh, do understand, however, that we'll be revisiting the psychology of problem solving, especially as how that, uh, uh, that part of psychology interacts or overlaps in some cases with some of the concepts that we'll be discussing in, the, in, our, uh, in our lectures on critical thinking. By now, you should have read the first two chapters in the Lewis Vaughn textbook. We're only going to go a, into a bit of the information you read in chapter one tonight. As Lewis Vaughn defines it, critical thinking is the systematic evaluation or formulation of beliefs or statements by rational standards. Let's break that definition down on the next slide. Let's expand on the definition a little bit. First, Vaughn tells us critical thinking is a systematic evaluation. By that, he means there are certain definitions, rules, methods, and procedures that must be learned to engage in critical thinking. As you might recall from reading chapter one, the evaluation Vaughn speak of, speaks of refers not only to an evaluation of our beliefs and statements of others, but of our own as well. The idea of rational standards on this slide is important because, as you'll learn, these rational standards are based on logic. The study of critical thinking, then, is not intended to give you the skills necessary to play gotcha and win arguments with others, but to arm you with the skills to know when you are being manipulated, or conversely, to be open to having your own mind changed by a well-crafted argument of another person. It also gives you the opportunity to reflect on your own beliefs and to decide whether some of those beliefs may need changing. The next slide digs even deeper into the meaning of our definition. Critical thinking, as this slide tells us, is not about what you think, but how you think. And it focuses not on what causes a belief, but whether it is worth believing. In a way, critical thinking is agnostic in the sense that critical thinking does not take sides. So what Vaughn means when he says it is not about what you think, but how you think, he's saying that your beliefs don't have a bearing on how well your argument is crafted. The truth may be on your side, but if you can't articulate that truth in a rational, logical way, your argument may be faulty. We are not to try to understand a person's motivation for what they believe, but whether it is worth believing based on how well crafted their argument is. The text goes on to make the argument that critical thinking can take several forms and serve several purposes, including providing skills for learning and exploring, giving us a defense against error, manipulation, and prejudice, and tools for self-discovery. As this slide tells us, Critical in the context of this course means exercising or involving careful judgment or judicious evaluation. It does not mean being critical of someone. Well, that's it for this lecture. Please be on the lookout for your next discussion to topic. Check the TTU I Learn course page uh, discussion section. Uh, that's where you'll find the topic. As always, do not hesitate to contact me with questions or concerns. Have a safe week. Class dismissed.